health, travel, finance, parenting, and entertainment. This is the Suburban Folk Podcast. I'm looking forward to having some real talk with some real folks. Hey, this is Greg with the Suburban Folk Podcast. My guest today is Mia Raker from the Parallel Passion Podcast. Mia, how are you? I'm great. I'm happy to be here. Introduction for how we came across each other on social media. You have your podcast that focuses on coders, software engineers, developers, and what other activities they have, hence the Parallel Passion name of the podcast. Yeah. And a lot of the subjects that you talk about in the episodes that I've had a chance to listen to definitely have some crossover to what we talk about on our podcast. So I'm very excited to have you take some time to talk to me today about your own passions, (laughs) as well as just some background about parallel passions and how you came up with that idea, um, how long you've been at it, challenges, things that have been good. But first, just in the same way you structure your episodes, what is your day job and what is the definition of a software engineer developer? There is no like um, actual definition as far as I know, but um, supposedly like uh, you you can only call yourself uh, an engineer if you actually did uh, like uh, computer science, if you actually studied that. Um, but uh, I don't know. I think you can call yourself whatever you want. Like there was a there was a time where I called myself like senior developer. Um, but you know whatever. Um, but what I do is um, I work for a Belgian startup that is like in um, accounting space, and I am a engineering manager slash team lead. I I could say um, of of one of the teams, and yeah, so. Most of the time, I am in the role of software developer, but then, like, also, I am in the role of a team leader and and all of that. Um, and yeah, that's that's basically my my day job. When I was looking at some of the videos and other audio that you had online, I came across one lecture that you were giving, and it had a lot of the features of your podcast. But you mentioned that for the group as a whole, their day job is something that they want to be doing. So it is a primary passion. Do you find that that is the case for for most technical workers? I'd say more than average. Let's say there are more people in in this, so in IT field that can say that this is actually what they like to do compared to other fields. I can definitely say that, but I'm not like I'm certain not everyone finds this their passion. I mean, even even me, like I like doing it. I, I enjoy doing it, but I also like doing other things. This is not, I don't want to spend the entirety of my time just coding. I'm not that guy, but there are people like that and that's fine. It's just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those. <laughs> well, and one last question, I have to ask you this. Do you find the stereotype that you see on TV? Like I think of the Saturday Night Live sketch, if you've ever seen it, it's, Nick Burns, your company's computer guy, and you know he just tells everybody to move yeah, yeah. and do everything, and says nobody knows what they're talking about. <laughs> Is that really yeah. that pervasive in the uh, in the IT world? Stereotype, yeah, definitely. And I mean, this exact stereotype is why I started my podcast, which is um, like you you mentioned before. It's called Parallel Passion, and it is about showcasing like the other hobbies software developers have. That's basically the entire. Like my my entire premise was like I wanted to showcase that like yeah software developers we're not all that stereotype like we're not all just like in in basement covered in Cheetos you know just hacking along <laughs> it's just like yeah we have uh, we have other hobbies as well we go outside sometimes <laughs> <laughs> one other thing that I wanted to get your feedback on again in the same video that I watched you had a segment about remote work and that's something that I definitely have a perspective on. In fact, I've just been able to work from home in the last year and I am a fan uh, for various reasons. And again, I, I saw that you had made a case for what those advantages are for remote work as well. So just to make sure we're talking about the same thing, 
when you say remote work, what does that mean to you? And then what are some of those advantages that you found? Well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of remote work, um, especially because um, I guess this is the same in, in US, but even more so in Europe, I think. There are like huge differences between um, countries, between areas of like income and of expenses of and everything. So um, it is a way like one of the reasons you would do remote or like the main reason I started was just I was able to get paid much more for the same work right so that's that's what I started but what I become to what I came to appreciate later on was that I could um, design my work exactly how I want it so um, you know some people like to work in an office some people like to be surrounded with other people and when when you're Working remotely, you have a choice. Uh, you you can design your workplace how you want it. Like if you if you like being surrounded with people, you can go to a cafe. You can go to a co working place. Um, if you if you like to be on your own, if you work best like me on your own, just by yourself. So you have also that's me, right? I I like to focus one hundred percent, and that means like just closing myself off from the world. Um, like turning on do not disturb or whatever and i can focus like 100 percent of my like brain to the task and that just enables me to do much more than i would ever be able to accomplish in in an office so that's why like i i like i started because you know money but now i actually love doing it because i just get more done and i'm i'm happier this way and you know if there's like a, a sunny day outside i can just close slack go out and like come back and work at evening or whatever agreed and i think that a lot of the flexibility that i've gained that i didn't necessarily realize that i would get from working from home has been a huge benefit specifically meetings tend to be a little more focused mm -hmm. uh, when everybody's not just sitting in one room and talking about what happened over the weekend or family things. Uh, obviously the commute goes without saying, yeah. but even just that amount of uh, conversation that goes on when somebody might stop in your office and maybe 20% of it. Yeah. You know, the classic like, Oh, did you see my email? It's like, I will reply to your email when I see it. Like, why are you asking me about it? And just like disrupting my flow. Yeah, exactly. And then that, five minute or what they think is a five minute amount of time coming in asking you about it probably cost you more like 15 minutes to a half hour, especially if you're in the middle of a project and you lose your place, uh, and depending on what's going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and again, even the flexibility of, yeah, you mentioned being able to close down when it's a nice day out. Um, I even think flexibility of other things that might be going on, whether that's having to run an errand that's easier to get to the grocery store or something yeah. like that when it's not the weekend and everybody else is there yeah. or um, even my, which we'll get into my workout regimen is a much easier to manage when I have a little bit more flexibility, when it doesn't necessarily have to be first thing in the morning. And let's be honest, the last time you really want to be doing any kind of workout is at the very end of a day when sun's down and you're already tired and you just want to <laughs> sort of relax to end the day. You know, we are, we're now in the winter time and it's just like, it's darkness all the time. <laughs> so yeah, I start working, it's dark. I end working, it's dark. So, you know, running in darkness is my, my only choice really if I don't want to go in the middle of the day. <laughs> the last time that I was training for a half marathon, I had, it definitely got into the point where it was getting dark and some of the roads that I'm on, are, uh, don't have a whole lot of extra room for anything but the cars. So that's another reason why if I could get it in <laughs> during those daylight hours, I feel a little bit better about it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to hit for just even definition of remote is do, do you relocate at all um, because you're remote or – have you been in the same place for a long period at this point? I mean, you you could, and I know people who are um, who do call themselves digital nomads, and I know people who are like um, moving from town to town every three months, and they like to work like that. 
Whereas me, like I'm, I'm addicted to coffee. I have a very <laughs> big and complex coffee setup at home that <laughs> I can't travel with. Um, and I have a very nice standing desk. I have a huge iMac, um, like spec'd up and everything. I have everything the way I like it to be. I have everything optimized for working. I have my nice mechanical keyboard, you know, a big, uh, big mouse. Everything is big because I, I like it that way. <laughs> And, and you you can travel like if you go in in cafe you have to sacrifice um, ergonomics and that's uh, I think it's okay if you do it like um, for a short time but I think long term it's not good for for your posture it's not good for your body to to force force it in like ways that's not supposed to. I mean even sitting is not great but you, you can combat it with like a really good chair and with a standing desk and everything. But sitting in a cafe, like hunched over a laptop, that's definitely not good. Yeah, I can't focus very well <laughs> in, a, in a setting like that. I almost, yeah. <laughs> I almost wonder if people go there just to be seen, so people think they're being important. <laughs> well, I mean, you have all sorts of people. Like I said, I know people who who go like every three months. They they change the environment completely, and they love doing it. Like they've been doing it for years. So. It's whatever works for you. That's the beauty about remote. That's what I always say. Like you get to design exactly how you like it. So if you want to move around, you can. If you want to stay at home like me, you can. You can do whatever. I think that's very important. Around our office, have the debate about the social interactions. And like I said, for me, it's been amazing to realize how much productive time I gained back by limiting the amount of social interactions. But there definitely have been folks that have said they get a little stir crazy if they're not around people. So that would be to your point mm. where folks may want to opt to go to an office or office or a cafe or something. Yeah, that's definitely a thing. Um, like you have to actively fight against, I don't want to say loneliness, but just like um, you tend to pull away from people. You you tend to just like, um, I, I think that's like it's lonely hut syndrome or something like that or cabin hut. I don't know. Um, it's, it's a known thing. Like, um, you have to actively force yourself to go to, I don't know, meetups or just run with friends or, um, call people up because you will not be seeing people from like your coworkers. Like when you think about it, a lot of people's social life comes just from coworkers, like talking with them, like the water cooler chats or whatever. And that simply goes away. I mean, yeah, sure, you have the random channel in Slack or whatever, but that's not the same. It's definitely not the same. And enter all the cliches, I think, with misunderstandings that can occur in email and or Slack as well um, can tend to be an issue. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and when you subtract out any phone or face-to-face -face conversations, I think there's a possibility that those could get even worse because <laughs> you don't remember that there's a human on the other end of that communication yeah text in general is hard i mean but anyone knows this now because even people who are in the same office use tools like slack or basecamp or even email i mean you know how easy it is to misunderstand someone um and it it gets even more highlighted yeah when when you do everything remotely when you don't see people face to face especially when you don't know someone personally and it's easy to assume like bad intentions, which you should never do. Like you should always assume good intentions, but it's just a human thing. Like you, you read the sentence and you're like, Oh, he's being so mean to me. And from that on that moment on, you don't like a person like there. It's just, it's a, it's a subconscious thing, right? You have to actively fight against it. Exactly. And would reiterate what you mentioned that you got to assume people have, the best intentions. They're not waking up in the morning out to get you or anybody else. So, yeah, well, <laughs> some people might, but you assume you assume they're not your coworkers. <laughs> yeah, hopefully the majority at least. So, if you start by thinking it's the majority, yeah. then uh, you you'll hopefully come at the communications with the right attitude. One other question I was curious about your thoughts. The four day work week concept has made some mm -hmm. waves recently, and I think it goes back into the flexibility we're talking about. Of course, burnout is something that's pointed to. What are mm -hmm. your thoughts with those pilots that are going on? I mean, I'm a big fan of Basecamp, or as it used to be known, 37 Signals. And they wrote a lot of books about this, like uh, rework and remote, and it doesn't have to be crazy at work. And 
like the way they they also have a blog signal versus noise which is really good and i and recommend reading it and um what they do is like every summer they do this so in summers they have um four working days and during the winter they have like full week like five working days um and and they say it works like really well for them and i think that's fine um i have never done it like in in a full time sort of way but there has definitely been weeks when i took like friday off or monday off um like two or three weeks in a row just you know it's a it's a nice weather or whatever and i just take an extended weekend so yeah i think i think that's good that's good for both for like personal and also as a team lead uh, to give that to your or or as a manager to give that to your people. And it was top of mind for me as I was putting together some notes for our conversation because it also gives people presumably time to pursue other passions that they may have that are outside of their day-to-day work. So talking mm-hmm. about your podcast, how did the idea come up? You talked about it a little bit as far as the stereotype of the IT folks and they don't necessarily do anything else. Was yeah. there anything else behind yeah. pulling the trigger and starting your podcast? How long have you been at it? And just other highlights that have that have occurred along the way. Well, I mean, the whole idea has been like, I, I used to go to programming conferences a lot. I don't do this as much anymore. I, I used to speak more now. Now it's not a thing anymore, but um Yeah, I did that. And whenever I was there, like especially at the after parties, I never wanted to talk about development because like the whole conference was about development. My entire like uh, career revolved around development. So I wanted to talk anything else. Like what do people do? What are their hobbies? And also because I want to talk about mine, right? (laughs) And um, I think just like sort of gradually when I started listening to podcasts, um, I was like, I could do that as well. And I I had this idea of like doing this sort of thing. So the same kind of talks that I had at after conference parties to to have like as a podcast. And then I came up with with the name Parallel Passion. I bought the domain immediately because I love the name. I still love it. Um, And then just, you know, a year passed. And then I was like, okay, I'll just, I have to do it. I just have to start doing it. And I think this was like... uh, it was around two years ago when I bought the domain and about a year and a half since my first uh, podcast, uh, since my first episode, I think, something like that. I've been pretty much posting every other week. Um, I've dropped a couple here and there. Like, I don't I don't worry because um, it, it's not like anyone's paying me to do it. It's not like there's like um, thousands and thousands of people in line waiting for, for the episode to drop. So I just do it because it's like one of my hobbies. I try to be like, I try to hold a schedule, but I don't like, if I miss it, I miss it. Yeah. I have a pretty similar story as far as the lead up to starting a podcast. I've started to compare it to the same reason why you'd write music. Mm. So for example, I played in bands in high school and college Mm. and once I got to the point where I wanted to write music, well, what's the reason? Because you're not hearing what you want to hear. Not to say you don't like other things, but there's yeah, still yeah, something yeah. else you feel like you can contribute. So yeah, yeah. I, you have your own voice that you want to be heard, right? Yeah, exactly. And so if it's not out there, then <laughs> have that can-do spirit and go ahead and produce it. And and I think mm-hmm. that podcasting definitely has that. Well, obviously it's a, it's something that you can do for people that, you know, have the will to to get it done. And, uh, I have found that so far the benefits, again, really going back to the theme of the passion is just even listening to folks that are talking about something that they want to be doing rather than for a paycheck or otherwise you can hear it in their voice, even (laughs) when they, yeah, yeah when they get into a rhythm and want to get into additional detail. So if anything, that's been my favorite part thus far, thus, excuse me, thus far, similar for you, would you say is the best part? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, also like when talking to people like at, at those after parties or wherever, you know, when they get that spark in their eyes, when they're just mm-hmm. like want to talk and talk and talk about their stuff, like that's the thing that you want to have. And that, that's the kind of things I want to talk about, like, because I know how I get like if, if someone asks me like now about these things that I like to do, I love talking about them. I love talking about like um, all sorts of things. And it's just it's just more fun. Right. That's that's the kind of things that like we like to do. So and podcasting is one of the ways we we get to 
be able to do it. And like we get to do it across the world. Like there is no way we would ever get to meet without podcasting, mm-hmm. like ever. Like it, it wouldn't just not happen. And I think that goes for like ugh, 80% of my guests. Like I would never have met them. But now like you have this conversation that we have now, for example. And, you know, it's it's sort of like on a friendly level, right? And And you... You have a connection that without these tools, without the internet, without all of this that we now take for granted, would just not be possible to do. And it's just, it's so great. Like, there's so many problems in the world right now, but also we have to appreciate how good it is. Like, there are so many good things and it's just, yeah, it's it's great. The other thing I would add in particular with the conversations is you have to be dialed in because you're recording, so you don't want to wander off in what the person is saying to you and then when it's your turn to respond you don't really know what they said and (laughs) there's either an awkward pause or it just doesn't make sense yeah you have to pay attention and uh, like i can't be on instagram right now when i'm talking to you i can't i can't be on twitter i can't be like which i think it's sort of sad but i i see people do this like they go for a dinner together or like over coffee or whatever and there's like both of them or all, everyone is on their own phones looking at whatever. They're not participating in any sorts of communication. Mm-hmm. And it is sort of sad, right? Because you are there. It's, I think you appreciate it even more like you and me when you work remotely, when you really appreciate it like person to person time. Um, and yeah, it, it sort of feels not great when the other person is looking at their phone. Yeah, definitely. And it even looks strange sometimes when, like you said, you're not in a crowd as often and you go into a bar or cafe and half the people, if not more, are in that position. It's like, man, something just seems off about this. Yeah. Now, maybe that's an age thing for folks that can remember a time <laughs> before that was happening. And Back in my day. Yeah, exactly. Like maybe if I'm, I don't know, 15 years younger, it wouldn't seem as strange because I grew up with it. But I agree that that connection is seeming to be lost when you look at certain scenarios. Getting into the passions part, when I was, again, doing some research on your social media pages, the first thing that uh, stood out to me was marathons. Mm. Uh, That's something that in my day-to-day life, I don't know if I know more than two people (laughs) that live near me that are marathoners. So I feel like it is a smaller club. So my eyes light up when I (laughs) see that somebody has participated in marathons. So how long have you been doing marathons how many races have you done i i think it's definitely more common here even like i i feel not so great because most of my friends are ultra marathoners so i'm just like oh yeah no i only go for 42 (laughs) kilometers like that's enough for me but they're like oh yeah no like whatever um so i i think it pretty much it it lines up with when i started working remotely so that would be like six years ago something like that i think 2014 uh, in spring of 2014. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I no, maybe I started like late 2013, but I know I started running in uh, 2014 because of a simpler reason. Like I was getting fat because right? I didn't move anymore. Um, and I wanted to do something about that. And I don't like to go to the gym. I don't like being inside. So I said, okay, like I'm going to start running. And I set myself a goal to complete a half marathon. And I followed a plan i think from runkeeper uh for like three and a half months and Mm -hmm. i completed that and at the end i said oh next year i'm gonna do the full one and so uh yeah i i (laughs) next year i did the full one and i suffered uh most of the time Uh, (laughs) so um from from every year since i i ran the full one i do it once a year Uh, it's always in in ljubljana but i did one in berlin just because, you know, now I can say that I ran a marathon in Berlin. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't I don't go particularly fast. Like my best time is from last year. I think it was three hours, uh, 34 minutes, something like that. 
Um, but this year I went three hours, 49 minutes because I started too fast and it was super hot and it was like a lot of problems, uh, as you know, on, on, like on a marathon, there's always problems. So if I'm doing the math, so you said it was like six years ago. So you've done six marathons overall, if you're doing one every year, 15, 16, 17, 18. And yeah. Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five, I did five so far. Yeah. Five marathons. One, the first one was half marathon, and then everyone else was uh, was a marathon. For the first marathon that you did, and you said how hard it was. Yeah. Do you think you trained? Do you think you overtrained? Do you think you undertrained? Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, so, you know, you're naive. You're young and naive, and and you're like, I think the longest I ran was like twenty five kilometers or something like that. Which yeah, I don't know how much is in miles, but not nearly enough. Right. Um, and, um, like halfway, right. A bit over halfway. And I was like, oh yeah, like the rest of the race is just the same, just more of this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but as you know, it's, it's not like that, right? Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's not like that. It, the second half is much harder than the first half. And I, I learned that the hard way. <laughs> Luckily, the time that I realized that was in a half marathon, so I didn't have to pay for quite as long, but I started <laughs> entirely too fast. My buddy had just come off of a triathlon Olympic distance, so he was in really good shape. He sent me a note two months maybe oh. before the race. I was not running much at the time, and he wanted to do – I wanted to say he wanted to break – 135 or 137 somewhere around there so pretty quick and i did the first three or four miles with him and of course he's you know at conversation pace which is what you're supposed to be doing right, right. i was definitely yeah. not and the rest of the race is not only are you hurting but the ego shot to watching <laughs> everybody passing yeah. you <laughs> it's, it's doubly bad because <laughs> uh, there's there's something to be said for whether or not you actually prepared the right way, or even if you were just giving yourself too much credit for where you lined up before <laughs> you start the race. Yeah. One of the things about me is that I'm really not a competitive person. So like, uh, if, you know, some people you can see, they can like, they, they can push to the last atom of strength, right? They, they really push through. And then after the, after they finish, they can't walk like for weeks because they, they, put everything out there mm -hmm. i'm not that kind of person like my my mind when i'm at like 90 percent of of like exhaustion my mind says like no walk you can't you, you should not run anymore you should walk now and so, so i walk and like next day i'm normal but yeah my times are not are, are i i think if i would be like uh, able to extract everything out of myself i would be able to go faster but I just, I don't care that much about speed and times, to be honest. Like, I, I run because I enjoy running. Um, it started because I wanted to lose weight, but now I do it just because it's a nice way to end the workday. So for me, this is how, like, I, I close Slack and I go out for a run. And that's, for me, I don't, I don't go near the computer again. Like, my, that's my commute, basically, right? That's my daily run is my commute. And it's, it's more for my mind than it is for my body now, I think. I agree that it gives you the chance to unplug um, yeah. whenever you go, whether that's first thing in the morning, if you can fit it in during lunchtime hours, mm -hmm. or if you're able to run at the end of the day. Yeah, it, it can even signify a transition maybe from whatever you're doing during the day to your night activities, especially even with family, right? I think it, it gives you that chance to even transition your mind that way to be ready mm. to you know check in with everybody in your family and what what their day was like and again leave the baggage of work or anything else that's going on behind so i would wholeheartedly agree with that uh, and also for reference for folks that may not be that familiar with marathon times 330 is just fine <laughs> you know you that was the goal for this year like to, to go under 330 and the first mm -hmm. half i ran really fast like i was i was feeling great really like the, the first half i was in at my conversational pace i i ran with a friend of mine who i like i caught up with her and we went together till like well then then she did the the half one so she uh she turned left and i continued and like i think for the 
first like two thirds of the race, everything went great. And then just like the whole body collapsed. <laughs> everything was just like, nope, you're not going to run anymore. And I was like, okay, well, apparently not. So I walked and hobbled uh, to the finish line. <laughs> Maybe that's just the way first marathons go because I... Oh, but this is the last one. This was this was a couple of months ago. Yeah. Oh, oh, <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Well, then maybe not. But what you're describing is very similar to what my first marathon was. I overtrained. I didn't, I didn't consult anybody that had done a marathon before. I just put my own schedule together. I want to say it was five, four to five Mm -hmm. months out. And for the long run, I just said, okay, if I add an extra mile every single weekend for that one, I'll be up to I even scheduled 26 miles, which mm. basically meant that I was going to run a 20 miler for the last month and a half <laughs> leading up to the marathon, which is too much. Yeah. Um, I, I ended up actually nearly getting hurt enough that I wasn't even going to be able to run. My knees were just oh. shot, you know, when I got close to that point. But, oh, yeah, that sucks. Yeah, but for the marathon itself is very similar to what you mentioned. I was feeling really, really good. I hit one of the pacers that I didn't think I'd ever hit. I want to say like the 340 guys because I just wanted mm. to be under four hours. So right, right, right. I ended up catching them at mile 16, I believe. Mm. And then we hit this big hill and I never saw them again. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, I still made it under four hours. But oh, wow. It That's is, really good for the it, first one. Congrats. Well, thank you. I, I was, that was my goal. And then the other thing, I actually told this story in a different episode with um, a couple guys that are physical therapists. I signed up my band to play at the finish line. So, <laughs> Not only did I have to do the race, they uh, let me do this, the event coordinators. Uh, I stretched for like, you know, 15 minutes maybe, and then walked back to mile 26 and played with my band for about an hour, which Mm. is cool to say. And of course, it's a cool story now, but I'm standing right in one place where I really need to be walking and, and, you know, continuing to stretch. (laughs) I was a mess the the very next week. (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine. I I think like for everyone, for anyone listening or for anyone who wants to run a marathon, like for the first one, I always say like just the the goal should be to finish it. Like don't, you should not care about the time. For the first one, you just like the goal is to finish. The goal is to pace yourself. The goal is to not burn out like like we did. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And emphasis on conversational pace. And just if that doesn't, if people don't know what that means, don't go any faster than being able to form a sentence and actually chat with somebody that you're running mm. next to, which is something mm. that I know you've talked about um, is making it a group activity. I am definitely yeah. guilty of very rarely being able to run with folks, but how do you make that work? Do you do weekend runs with folks or are you able to even during the week? Uh, get groups together it it really depends like so here there are a lot of running groups but i don't know maybe maybe it's my personality i oh there's always someone in the group i don't like too much so you know (laughs) um uh, then then i don't uh, i i don't like running in large groups but i do like running with like one or two or three people like small groups i i really enjoy that and um it's just during the the cup the last six years or whatever that i've been running i've managed to meet a like people who run at similar speed and similar distances that I do. So yeah, if I do it the weekend one weekend run, then it's like it's a trail run. We go like um on the hills or whatever. Mm-hmm. But if it's during a week, it's just like a, a shorter run whenever people have time. Cause you know, I work from home, so I can be totally flexible to to their schedule. Um and I I like normally is it's least at least once or twice per week where I run with someone else. And I would imagine for pacing that it is really helpful, probably even both ways, that it makes sure you don't go too fast again it, for no other reason than you can be social. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 like going um, for a drink with a friend, right? It's it's same but healthier. You just talk about stuff, about life, about love, about anything that you that you want to talk about, and it's just at that kind of pace you even forget you're running i know this sounds strange to anyone that doesn't run but believe me like after you've been running for like three four or five months where it becomes second nature to run at like normal speed normal pace 
then you can hold a conversation and you really forget you're running. It's, it's, it's magical. It's what it is. I agree. And also something that people probably don't recognize if they just hate running, if they can't get past making it a habit is you really do feel much, much better after getting a run in almost better the whole day than you would uh, on the yeah. days that you don't have a chance to run. I even subscribe to, mm. if I've had a, uh, late night the night before, (laughs) we'll leave it at that. If I can force myself to get up and run first thing in the morning, it helps. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm I'm with you 100%. Like uh, at those conferences, right? uh, Mm -hmm. You you know what happens. Like we drink too much, way too much. And then the next day, especially when the conferences last for multiple days, like the next day, people start coming in like in the afternoon because, right. you know, hangover and everything. Uh, but I always like I I wake up early by myself. I don't even use an alarm clock because I, I can't sleep during the day. So I just I, I drink some electrolytes or whatever and I go for like a short run. And then, yeah, like you said, it helps so much. Like I'm I'm back to normal working temperature and I, I can keep this up for like two three days uh, not past that but like yeah two three days definitely yeah i i think that is definitely the case so let me go back to what you mentioned with maybe folks in europe versus america and the distance and how many people would do marathons because to be honest when i started talking about marathons on the podcast I, in the back of my mind i was nervous that I was presenting too much <laughs> that people I would lose people because they say, oh, marathon, I'm not going to do that versus a 5K, 10K, <laughs> whatever it happens to be. So yeah. do you find that if you bring up the topic to people that are not runners by background, that you keep their interest, even though it is that longer distance? Uh, probably not. I, I mean, it's it's one of those <laughs> things that you learn, right? As you get older, you learn to read the room. Mm-hmm. It's it's uh, the same way I don't talk about development topics with, with non-developers. It's the same with like running about, uh, I don't talk about running with non-runners unless they ask me about it. Because... Mm-hmm. Uh, as you know, like if you if you don't run, it's hard to understand how can anyone find this pleasurable. Like how can how can we enjoy it? Like it's it's impossible to understand if you've never run for a long enough time to to enjoy it. Because you have to pers- like the first three four months something like that, it's gonna be a pain in the ass. It's just it's not gonna be nice. But then like. The more you do it, the more it just becomes a habit and you sort of get addicted to it. And then it's really like it, it becomes enjoyable, I guess. And if, if you've never experienced that, it's it's impossible to understand, I think. I happen to fall into the long distance running simply from the standpoint I used to live in Salt Lake City a couple years out of school and mm-hmm. I didn't know anybody in the area. So I lived right next to one of the larger mountains and just started running up the trail and it had the mile markers. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. well I'll go up, you know, the three miles. And of course if I'm coming up three miles, I got to come down three miles and you know, another mile and another mile. Yeah. And I had no idea how long this particular trail was. Turned out it was nine miles up, which of course means, you go nine miles up, you got to come nine miles back, which you're yeah, getting close yeah. to that marathon distance. And also in yeah, yeah, yeah. in that city, yeah, and in that city, people are very, very active. So you almost felt extra guilty mm. <laughs> uh, not working out <laughs> than maybe in other towns. So it was really from that experience that I even got the idea of long distance running. So maybe that helped sort of trick me right. <laughs> into thinking it was something that I wanted to do. Oh yeah, no. I mean, it's definitely depends on um, like where you are and what do people around you do, right? Mm-hmm. If if no one around you, if you don't know anyone who's running marathons, you're not just going to be the weird one and just start running like Forrest Gump, right? <laughs> um you you have to have someone to like that you're like, "Oh, you do that. Um maybe I can do that as well." Um, if you don't have anyone like that, if you don't know anyone like that, then yeah, you you won't just start running, I guess. Last topic, well, maybe last topic on running. What <laughs> about injuries? So I, like I said, I mentioned knees was definitely something for me the first time yeah. out here and there, other aches and pains that I've had. Have you experienced any major injury issues? I mean, knock on wood, but uh, 
nothing major yet. I had some minor issues with like um, uh, Achilles tendon. Um, mm-hmm. I, like it, it hurt a lot when I uh, when I woke up. I could barely like I couldn't stretch my uh, my legs enough. I guess so for the first like thirty minutes after I woke up, I had a hard time walking normally. Uh, but then after I warmed up, it was fine. Um, but now, like no, it's it's really I have no in, no problems with any injuries whatsoever. Um, I did like when I started running, I did go in a sort of like a group school sort of thing where they at least gave us like the basics of running technique. So I'm not like doing something really really bad. My technique is not perfect. Uh, of course not, but it's not terrible. So I think that helps a lot with with injuries. At least I I, I think that I'm not certain, but um, it's yeah I, I haven't had any any problems. Luckily, did you have anything else besides your knees? I did have the Achilles thing um, as well, where it would just be a sharp pain in the back of my heel for the first yeah. mile or two. And then once it got warmed up, it would be mm-hmm. better. I found that doing the foam roller immediately after and just mm-hmm. keeping it warm, it did gradually go away. What I'm starting to deal with now, and maybe I should preface this with all the things that we talked about for first time runners that they should do. I'm throwing a lot of those things out the window because the second marathon I ran mm-hmm. I was a 324 oh, wow. and I jokingly said, if I do another marathon, I'm just close enough to a Boston qualifying time that I should really, really focus and see if I can get to that level. And of course that is, that's ambitious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I am now doing six days a week, uh, for training I am definitely pushing my pace, so I'm trying to be mindful of the conversational uh, speed that I'm going, but I'm probably pushing it a little further than I should. And so the Mm. first maybe injury that's starting to creep up is some soreness in my hamstring, which I think is definitely due to probably pushing it a little bit too much. So that's I've had that before uh, a few years back where it was similar, just kind Mm. of the sharp pain, but you give it a mile or so, it will subside and be fine. But since I've got a ways to go in this training, I've just started. Um, I'm definitely trying to be as mindful as I can for not having it sidetrack the overall training, but um, also not to aggravate it further. Maybe it's better to like pull back a, a bit and just keep up the consistency. And then when everything is normal, just like uh, push again. Because otherwise, like you, you risk injury, and um, then, then like, yeah, nothing good can happen after that. Exactly, and you also, I think that's where the bad press can sometimes come in for the long distance running. You know, when you see people say at a certain age, "Oh, you need to find a new activity because of the amount of um, just damage you can do to your joints," and you know, switch to swimming or switch to mm-hmm. something else. Actually, that was why I did a triathlon episode a little while back, because at some point I actually do plan to substitute my running with other activities to save my knees and save my joints a little bit. But yeah. up to this point, um, I still enjoy running the most. So it's what I gravitate to. So trying to be as smart as I can with it. Yeah, I haven't done triathlon, but I've heard of of people that like it's it's much more easier to overtrain there because it's like three different disciplines, and you can train all of those, and you can feel like there are different muscles, but your body suffers, right? And and you can overtrain, and then it's like yeah, it it can be really bad. Is what I heard. Like I I have no experience of my own. Right. I don't have a whole lot of experience except for the folks that I have talked to. And I think if I do get into that world, which I plan to, I'll probably stick to some shorter races <laughs> so that I don't <laughs> get into that kind of an issue. As much as I'd love to say that I could do an Ironman <laughs> right this second, I'm not going to say that that's something I'm going to jump into. Yeah, that's crazy. Especially the full one. I'm like, how, <laughs> how can you swim even that much? And then, okay, by I think I, I can I can do, but after all that, run a full marathon? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did one dual athlon, I guess they call it, which it was a 5K 
a 30 mile bike and then a 10 K. And of course, when you get off that bike, your legs are just <laughs> wobbling all over the place. Yeah. So for the people that can do that is awesome. I'm in awe of it. And like I said, I'm definitely eyeing it up as my next activity. But yeah, when you yeah. look at it objectively, it's like, man, that is putting yourself through the ringer. Yeah. I'm, I'm just like, I'm in such an awe of these people, like the Ironman people, yeah. like, cause they they run marathons better than than I do, and they mm-hmm. they had to do all all of that before. I'm just like I just I don't I don't even understand it. Like it's it's that's not human. That's not human. <laughs> yeah, and the recovery afterwards, as I understand it, your body's just completely yeah. at zero for at least a week, probably even longer. That you probably shouldn't be doing much of anything. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Um, the other thing I had on the list, and you had talked about your setup for coffee. Um, mm. I am a coffee drinker. I tend to mm-hmm. come at coffee the same way I come at beer. Uh, I appreciate the higher end of the spectrum, mm-hmm. but I'm not above drinking, you know, bottom of the barrel <laughs> types. Yeah, yeah. Where do you fall? It's 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 fine. It's actually the same with me. I don't mind drinking bad coffee. I, I I have no problem with it. But if I have a choice, I prefer to go for high end and, and high end. And I do appreciate high end. I do appreciate specialty coffee. Uh, like I mentioned before, I have a very <laughs> complex setup at home. Um, and yeah, I can I can dive into that. But like it's the, the whole. I guess love for coffee comes from my first visit to US. Like I went to Portland in 2013, Oregon. And mm-hmm. uh everyone says like oh you should go you should try coffee there and I'm like what Americans don't know how to make coffee because you know we're <laughs> next to we're next to Italy so we have this um uh, I don't know uh like in in here like if it's not espresso it's not coffee, right? Mm-hmm. Um so the everything you see on TV on or in movies like the American drip coffee like that's not coffee that's just yeah it's just uh, dirty water. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, so I went to Portland and I I went to this weird bar that I found on Foursquare uh, back back then when people were still using Foursquare, and uh, it was the most amazing cup of coffee I've had in my life. <laughs> like it tasted like strawberries. And I was like, what, what is this? Like, is mm-hmm. coffee supposed to taste like this? What is this? Um, and then, yeah, I got exposed to the whole specialty coffee. And when I came back, all I wanted was just to drink more of that coffee. And it was very hard to get back there, back then here. Like now we have a lot of like the specialty roasters and, and the coffee scene is much better. Uh, but back then there was nothing, so I had to order it in from from UK, from Germany, from all over the place. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I I can talk a lot about coffee, but I, I don't know if you wanna if you do if you wanna listen to me talk about coffee. So, <laughs> well, let's let's hit some of those very basics. So, like you said, the American version of you know you've got the grounds and you just have the drip come through. So when you say your coffee setup, it is at the very least what we would think of of like an espresso machine what the what is in that setup and how is it different so i have a very big and expensive grinder and then i have a dual boiler espresso machine which is the one that can both make espresso and steam milk at the same time because you need different temperatures for these things and if you want it fast if if you want it consistent you need dual boilers and that means um, also more expensive. Um, I also like to do uh, pour overs, like maybe you've heard of V60. Um, that's that's like a, a kind of prep, like a, a thing uh, that enables you to do really nice coffee kind kind of fat. Mm-hmm. It's like it's more of a filtered coffee. You can get it in any specialty coffee shop, uh, I guess. Um, it's it's really nice, or just Aeropress, um, a- anything like that. Uh, but you know, it really depends then on on the coffee, and I uh, I get most of my coffee beans from still from UK and Germany because they have the best roasters. Um, they they have the purchasing power, so they can get the like they can get better green beans that our local guys can. Um, so it's just it just tastes better is what it is. Um, yeah. So uh, that, yeah, that was going to be my question for those two countries i wouldn't necessarily think coffee <laughs> from either so it's just a matter of buying power uh yeah but you know berlin is is very hipster city and the uh, roasteries in berlin are like 
top of the world and same goes for london uh so it's so it's just that like they have really really good roasters in in both of those places um so yeah you you can imagine like uh berlin is like a european version of portland basically gotcha yeah which actually reminds me by the way again in the main talk that i watched you give and i love your hipster jokes by the way <laughs> um, so for example in that one you were talking about uh hipsters and their avocados taking away from the uh coffee growth yeah oh yeah no it's the worst like when i read that article so like a, sh- a short uh, that basically there there was an article that uh because um there are so many people who want avocados now like kenyan farmers are throwing out coffee and are planting avocados and i'm just i'm going mad because i really like kenyan coffee and now like there's gonna be less of it um and there's another problem with coffee like it takes five years since you plant it till when you can like um get the the cherries um and you know the no no farmer is gonna risk five years of produce meaning once they plant avocados, they're not going back to mm-hmm. coffee. It's just never. So yeah, it's it's just it's it's just a sad state of affairs. Like leave my coffee alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I tend to have that same perspective. And while I am probably having just the regular American style coffee, something else I know you've talked about mm-hmm. is it's in the morning. So it gives you sort of that first thing to look forward to. I agree with that, that as soon as I get up, mm. I'm headed right over to the coffee machine and start you on the right track. Yeah, you yeah, know, definitely. For, for me, it's like, it's a ritual. Um, you know, it, w- w- the more complex the setup, the longer it takes to make a cup of coffee, right. but like, I really enjoy it. I enjoy making it. I enjoy drinking it. Like the first 30 minutes of, of the day is like my day with coffee and book and, and journal. That's what I do. How do you feel about Starbucks style mochas, lattes, cappuccinos that have lots of sugar, lots of other stuff in those? Do you consider them even in the same category? Do you stay away from them? Well, uh, for me, those are like coffee infused drinks. They're not really coffee. And and if mm-hmm. you like drinking that, it's fine. Like I mean, I've had uh a drink like that from time to time. You know, it's it's winter, you're cold, like you want something sweet. And it's just like if it has a slight hint of coffee, it's just for the better. Um but one thing that at least Starbucks is here in Europe, I don't know if it's the same in US, uh have got like mm-hmm. recently pretty much everywhere, is the blonde roast. Uh, which mm-hmm. like Starbucks has the, the regular roast is like really, really dark. Like it's, it's basically right. charcoal um, and it's not drinkable. And the blonde one is what anyone, what any other roaster would call like medium dark, something like that. Mm-hmm. It's not bad, actually. Um, it's, it's, it's not great, but it's actually, it's, it's, it's not bad. So if I am in a place like, let's say an airport and I see Starbucks, I will go there just for like a, nice uh, uh like blonde roast espresso or something like that it's it's not bad i recommend it well, actually see we're finding common ground no pun intended grounds there <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah i'm the exact same way at starbucks i was never a fan of their pike place i think is sort of the standard one but when they introduce the blonde yeah i think that that's pretty good so i almost exclusively will order that you also talked about photography and you mm. you helped me fill in some of the blanks of <laughs> again some of the the things that I've seen on your social media for example these gigantic crowds that you're in front of oh, yeah. which I was like are you speaking to these people or what's going on <laughs> so those were gigs that you had doing event photography yeah um i i don't know which photos you saw but yeah uh there there was only one time where i spoke in front of a really large crowd uh everything else was in front of like 100 to 400 people so much much smaller meetups um but yeah uh i was a i was an event photographer in my let's say from my 17 something like that till like 26 27 i did, did it for like 10 years um and uh yeah i i did uh quite a lot of big gigs um well you know i was just a photographer i was not the, i was not the center of attention uh but yeah being in front of huge crowds uh it's uh it, it's a special feeling i guess especially if you're on stage and you're looking down let's say in a, in a big festival like exit festival in serbia and there are like mm-hmm. sixty thousand people below you and you're on the stage it's just it's an incredible feeling really 
it's, it's it's just like yeah and i can't even imagine how it is if you're actual the actual artist that the people are lining up for it's just it has to be amazing i can only imagine that especially for people that have written a song and then to get in front of that many people that like that song yeah. and are singing it in front of you and yeah. so on and something else that's on my bucket list i don't know if i'll be able to do it is the european festivals whenever i see some of the lineups and the amount of bands that mm. they can get versus the American mm. ones. I'm like, oh man, why why don't these <laughs> shows come here? I mean, I've just seen the lineup for summer of 2020. And it again, if I could just get to one of these shows, like half of my favorite bands, it seems like, are on these. So I can only imagine the crowds must be equally huge yeah. compared to the shows that I'm used to. Yeah, and, you know, uh, they usually travel because this um the main festivals are are very well known and they are sort of lined up and like every week or every other week and a lot of these bands has have like um just travel from one to another so that's why you can see the same band like uh, headlining in, in all of those festivals every year um which is is definitely a thing and if you're a huge fan of music like I am, that's the best way to just like come close to it and maybe even know some of the the people in in the backstage or anything if you get access. For me that was really like why I started to do it. Like I was, you know, I like photography but I loved music. Um I was uh I was not a good uh player of of anything. I'm a terrible mm-hmm. singer. Um, so the only way to get close to this world was like to, to be uh, a photographer. And yeah, I did like, I, I managed to get close to a lot of people to talk to a lot of people. And, you know, when you're a teenager or like in your early twenties, it's, it really like fills up your ego and just like in general, (laughs) like life satisfaction and then everything. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. Are you able to uh, to name drop anybody that you got a chance to meet? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Like, um, I don't know how popular Prodigy are in in yeah, US, sure. but for me, they're like one of my. They were always. I, I loved that band ever since I was growing up, um, and having to 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 meet them even shortly uh, was like uh, really special. And then, like when this year Keith. Uh, he passed away, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he passed away. He he committed suicide. It was uh it was hard because you know, you wanna hear more of your favorite artists. And I, I now I sort of can relate how it was for like, you know, my father was a huge fan of Nirvana and um second last show Nirvana did was in Slovenia and my father was there and then like Kurt Cobain shot himself. And mm-hmm. it was it was very emotional for my father. And I think this is like Whereas they're they're not the same kind of band. It it feels it it felt the same for me. Right? It was it was emotional for me. But I don't know. I mean, if you if you want to talk about uh, like really popular people, then yeah, uh, Paris Hilton follows me on Twitter still. So that's a that's a thing I like to, to name drop. <laughs> yeah. right. No, that's a name drop. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, actually the bands you were mentioning, that's really right down my alley, kind of to Mm. your point of the people that have died in the bands. I mean, going to the Seattle bands, Chris Cornell had just passed away, Scott Weiland, they weren't a Seattle band, but Stone Temple Pilots were sort of right in the same genre. Um, Alice in Chains, of course, their singer Mm. had passed away years ago. So yeah, looking back at that, and like you said, sort of. Um, owning it in your youth and then seeing that none of those original lineups except Pearl Jam at this point are even yeah. left is really kind of depressing. So no, I, I hear exactly what you're saying for, for prodigy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I listen to them some, and obviously clearly it sounds like we yeah. probably could do a whole other episode on our musical tastes. <laughs> but uh, you know, that's the, that's the thing I like about this sort of part podcast. Like you discover things you have in common and you just want to keep talking like for another hour. So but random stuff well I, we are hitting about the hour so maybe if we go ahead to your social media uh where people can find you uh, talk a little bit more again about the podcast i know you mentioned the episodes or any other upcoming events that you have going on yeah the the podcast is like i said parallel passion uh it's easy to find it's in english um 
my social networks are mostly in English. Sometimes it's in Slovenian. It's my first name, my last name. You, you should just click the link in the show notes because you won't be able to just spell it if I just name it out. Um, and uh, yeah, so Instagram, I guess, is, is my favorite social network nowadays. Um, I used to tweet a lot. I don't do it so much anymore. I try to leave Facebook. Like I'm really, I'm only there just because of my photography page and everyone who's like a fan there and everything. Mm -hmm. But I, I really dislike Facebook. I <laughs> just, oh, it's the worst. Um, it, yeah, and and I know, I know, Instagram is owned by Facebook. Like I get it, but still, like I, I like the social network. People right. are nicer on Instagram than they are anywhere else because it's not the kind of venue where you can just like talk shit you post nice things there and then that's what I like about it. It's only the nice stuff, right? Yeah, that's, I am definitely just now starting to even figure out Instagram. I just never used it before, but I can see that that would be the case because it takes a little bit more work, mm -hmm. I feel like, to have your Instagram page be worth looking at as far as the media that you post. And and you can't just randomly troll like you can on Twitter. It's it's different. Like you, you can't just post random stuff. And if you like, it's impossible to reach huge crowds like it is super easy on Twitter. Like if you have a reply go viral or whatever, like then it's just, yeah, it's not, it's not good. It's toxic. And, and Instagram is none of that or like very, very like small amounts of that. And it's easy to just avoid this kind of people. Whereas on Twitter, it's not so easy. They find you. Right. And I definitely agree that it's not worth spending your time and energy when you see the negative posts and yeah. anything like that. So maybe the more I get into Instagram, <laughs> the more I'll even appreciate that. I just, yeah. I definitely have a learning curve still ahead of me. Yeah, I was there since the beginning because they were first, they were on iPhone only. I still remember those days. Uh, it was it was on iOS only. It wasn't even on Android and I remember when it was like expanded to Android and we were all like, oh, no, no, like everyone's going to get Instagram. Now I'm not the hipster anymore, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. now like yeah, I, I, I like it. And maybe because I, you know, I'm a sort of photographer. I like to think of myself as a photographer and that's why I like to, to share some stuff. I just I, I recently got a drone, so I'm now playing with that. Um, and, and posting some drones, drone photos there. But yeah, no, I, I, I enjoy it. So yeah, definitely. If you want to, if you want to know more about me, yeah, go follow me on, on Instagram. Actually, I just thought of one more question to, to extend us a little bit further. Um, sure. as far as reading material, it made me think of, cause that's what I use Instagram quite a bit for is just to post, mm -hmm. um, whatever I've either been listening to or, uh, reading, um, and you, yeah. I know, have talked about the Stoicism books, and I'm sure you're obviously reading other things. Um, anything to recommend for folks that that's something that they should look at and, you know, a good way to sort of keep a positive outlook? Yeah, um, it's, I think the book that the, changed my life the most, uh, it's by William B. Irvine. It's a, a Guide to the Good Life. Um, it, I know, I know how it sounds like I just, I, I know. Uh, but it's it's a really good book. Like it sort of tells uh, a story about stoicism, but it starts just about philosophy, and it's about it's saying how it used to be like in 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 Greek times, in Roman times, that like you chose a philosophy of life, like whichever that was. Just like there was a philosophy of what you wanted to achieve in your life, like what what things you valued. Whereas now it feels more like we're just going like from one thing to the other. And we don't really know what we want long term, um, like long term goals. Like what what is it that what sort of things we value? What do we want out of our lives? And it makes first it makes a point that you should have a philosophy, and then it tries to present that like stoicism is the philosophy. Um, you don't have to agree with it; it's fine. I don't agree with like one hundred percent of it, but I really recommend uh, I really recommend the book. So. Yeah, that's that's definitely one of the one of the books I can recommend if 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 this is what you were aiming for. Yeah, that's perfect. Well, and I will be sure to uh, grab a link to it, and I'm sure we can get it on on Amazon and, and other places. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember you talking about it, and is I'm always interested in overall outlooks on life um, topics. So it 
was something that piqued my interest. So I think it is worth uh, pointing folks towards. So, um, and like you mentioned, of course, I'll put all of your contact information in the show notes when we post the episode. Well, Mia, I really enjoy our conversation and I appreciate you taking some time. You have an open invite to come on whenever you would like. (laughs) Oh man, I'd love to. I enjoy this very much. Like, as as you can see, I love talking about myself. So (laughs) whenever... (laughs) That's right. It's the best topic there is. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, again, I appreciate it. And I will talk to you next time. Yeah. Talk to you soon. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to give us a rating on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get podcasts. If you'd like to be notified of future weekly shows, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you. Suburban Folk is part of the Pod All the Time podcast network with six other great podcasts. They include The Creative Intuitive, Another Digital Citizen, Random Unnamed Podcast, The Cop End Podcast, Big IQ Podcast, and Real AKA Truth. If you check us out on Twitter, you can see links to their direct pages to see what they're up to.